So tonight we are gathered to ensure dignity, justice, and personhood for birthing patients. There is no point in pregnancy when a person loses their fundamental rights, yet our panelists will be able to provide you with some history and examples of when and how pregnant patients lose their human and civil rights, and in some cases, much more. I want to start by defining a term that may be new to some people in the room. It is obstetric violence. Obstetric violence occurs at an intersection between institutional violence and violence against people during pregnancy, childbirth, and the postpartum period. And it occurs both in public and private medical practice. For too many people, pregnancy, labor, and delivery is a period associated with suffering, humiliation, ill health, and even death. Obstetric violence can be manifested through the denial of treatment, the disregard of a pregnant person's need of pain, verbal humil hum humiliations, invasive practices, physical violence, unnecessary use of medication, forced medical intervention, dehumanizing or rude treatment and discrimination or humiliation based on race, ethnic or economic background, age, HIV status, and gender nonconformity, among others. So my first question is, Katie. How common is obstetric violence, and historically, what has led us to this point? Thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you all for so much for coming out tonight. Um, so, to talk a little bit about the history of obstetric violence, I think is really to talk about the history of obstetrics. Um, so, <laughs> in a, in America, or traditionally, historically. Uh, midwives have been the birth keepers for their communities and the, um, the profession or the people who have um, been with women and been with birthing people, providing their reproductive health care, all of their pregnancy care, the catching the baby and postpartum care. Um, and when that started to shift essentially was on plantations in the American South during slavery. And the Essentially, the institution of obstetrics is a, a tool um, that was invented to try and maximize the economic productivity on slave plantations because that's what um, that's what uh, children were. That's what black babies were in that context um, was something that uh, was capital. Um, and so the the. <coughs> The driving goal and the driving force in the creation of obstetrics was not for birthing people's <laughs> health and well-being and happiness and fullness and for them to have good experiences. The purpose of obstetrics was to have the most, uh, the most people who were fit for agricultural work. Um, and so I think when we look at obstetric violence today, it is really easy to see how women are not really seen or treated as full humans during this time. Um, and many of the policies, many of the, much of the rationale behind a lot of obstetric violence um, is essentially to coerce uh, birthing people into doing something that the provider thinks is going to lead to a safer outcome. Um, and it, so it's really easy to see where that mentality of the only thing that matters is the outcome and not how we got there and not who wanted that outcome and not, um, it's easy to see that when we understand the kind of what the purpose was behind this medicine to begin with. Um, and I think uh, and I think it's important for us to realize also that, especially in like medicine time, slavery really was like slavery generally wasn't that long ago, and especially in medicine time, it wasn't that long ago. And what I mean to say by that is that uh, right now in 2019, most of the doctors who um, hold prominence in their field, most of the doctors with power, uh, were trained in the 1980s. And in the 1980s, when they were being trained, the doctors who trained them were trained in the 1940s, who trained them in the 1900s, who trained them in the 1860s, and slavery didn't end until 19, 1865. So really, like, the doctors who are in power now are fourth generation trainees of people who trained and practiced, literally practiced on slave women who had no autonomy, who were not involved in the care that they were receiving. Um, 
And because from then until now, we've never really had a period of time where we said like, hey, seeing as, seeing as women aren't slaves, um, let's think through how we provide care to them uh, or how they provide care amongst themselves. Um, how do we do that in a way that respects their full humanity? We've never had that process. Um, and so the second part of the question is how pervasive is obsession violence? Is It's everywhere. Um, and I think there, uh, in, the, in the birth world, it is much more the norm than the exception to talk with people who have recently had babies, um, who felt ignored, who felt disrespected, who did not have the birth experience and were not treated um, the way they thought they should, or the, sorry, not the way they thought they should, the way that we, they definitely should. <laughs> um, and uh, so the spectrum of how that violence plays out is pretty broad, you know, so that could just be like, oh yeah, they weren't really listening to me, but uh, everything worked out, or the second time I said it, they cued in, um, all the way to uh, cases where women are receive, uh, have forcible surgery against their consent, without, you know, without their consent against their explicit wishes. Um, but it's all on a continuum that comes from this space of not really seeing or valuing um, birthing people as people. Thank you so much. Um, F.A., I'm wondering if you can kind of continue the conversation and talk about um, where else we see people treated in this way in today's time. Yes, um, I also want to touch a little bit more on what you were saying, Katie, in terms of where um, providers were practicing and on enslaved women. So I'm not sure many of you are aware of the history of J. Marion Sims. Um, J. Marion Sims performed surgical techniques on enslaved women without anesthesia that he performed by creating um, the speculum, things that we're using today. Um, the fistula, which is a, a surgical procedure that's performed on pregnant women. And so these procedures were practiced on and finalized on black women and enslaved women, and they were performed in spaces like this, where people will come to pay to watch and perform these procedures on enslaved women. So a lot of these practices that we are seeing in our birth and labor and delivery floors now came from that um, scenario, as well as when we think about, um, how Katie was mentioning the economic value of slaves, Black women or enslaved women were currently having to reproduce. So if you had more babies, you were not more valuable than just a man who was also working in the fields. And so when women were whipped during their slavery, they had to lay their bellies in holes in the ground so they would whip them on the backs but making sure that their economical value that was in their wombs was protected, right? And so where we see this happening today is, you know, that obstetric violence of beating on women, performing practices, giving them medication without their consent, sterilizing people. Um, that's what we're seeing in the sector violence today. We've seen women who um, go in for you know, removing the tumor and coming out without their uterus because that provider felt, you have too many children, you don't need any children, you're not educated enough to have children, and we see the replica of genocide. Um, and so American medicine for black women, whether from infant mortality to life expectancy, along with what we call medical racism and weathering. And so the concept of racism that you're experiencing throughout the day, whether it be the police showing up at your door because they want to look at the cameras for an incident that happened, or the police showing up at the subways, or you not getting this job, or whatever that institution is, you may see whether it's at your body. And so when you, thought, you do finally have children, you are not more high risk because of the stress factors uh, that you experience throughout your life. And that is often passed down generationally. We now know that this lives in the body, and then it gets passed down genetically when you do have children. And so you have this lower quality of care for women, um, and black women, we have a history of slavery to financial stability. Um, we think a lot about, well, what happened after slavery? We had mass incarceration, which we have today. So mass incarceration is also for economic value, right? And so we put people in these cells, and we have them produce, and then we sell it, and we don't really do it with that income, right? And then we have other institutions that are having these pipelines to mass incarceration. So we have the NICU to prison pipeline, we have sexual abuse to prison pipeline, we have school to the prison pipeline, and we 
have hospital births to the prison pipeline. We have high C-section rates that are also for economic value. So when you're looking at this, you have women who are in labor, and if you're not laboring in the ways that they want you to, which could be whatever reason, right? You know, the baby's too big, baby's too small, your fluids are too high, your fluids are too low, maybe you're too old, you're a geriatric pregnancy at 35, or your BMI is too high, maybe you have an HIV status, maybe you have Medicaid and public insurance, maybe you're in a hospital that's understaffed. A lot of these leads to a high C-section rate. So now this provider now needs to rush your labor, put you in danger. So you're being yelled at, you're being starved because you can't eat, you can't drink water, you know, they give you ice chips. And so we even already as we know that evidence-based care practices are not happening, that what the policies that are being constructed on in the hospitals are coming from insurance companies who are protecting their value of the economic value. The more C-sections we do, the more inductions we do, the more money this hospital gets. Um, and so that's a little connection with how slavery in terms of mass incarceration that we connects to institutional uh, birth outcomes and how black women are now four to five times, it used to be three to four times, so the statistic is rising continuously over the last few years, even with a lot of the activism that we are doing. And so what we're seeing is that these hospitals are still harmful and violent institutions, and we're not addressing that. We're addressing implicit bias on the individual level, like we need to train staff about racism, but institutionally, the practices and the policies are still stemming from racism and slavery. And so because it hasn't been a truth and reconciliation moment, these things are going to continue to happen regardless of an implicit bias training is implemented. Thank you so much, Um Lynn, you have been doing advocacy and legal work in birth justice your entire career. Can you give us a very brief highlight, quick history? Um, of what you have seen and maybe provide examples of when pregnant patients have not been afforded their rights. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> so one thing I'd like to do, uh, could you raise your hand if you know somebody who's been pregnant? <laughs> so like 100% of you know somebody who's been pregnant. And yet what we find is the things that the people who have the capacity for pregnancy need, like reproductive health care and reproductive rights, are treated as sort of this separate subgroup of category of special interests, as opposed to what path the people need in order for their health to be good and in order for the species, for everybody, the benefit of everybody for the species to survive. How does that happen? And we're, we're a country that was built on the idea that some people can own and control the bodies and lives of others. And I think black people in particular see that, feel that, experience that every single day of their lives. Uh, for those of us who are white, we might only experience it or experience it for the first time when we're trying to give birth. And then it's like so surprising. Somebody's telling me I can't decide what's going to happen to my own body. But it is, uh, there are many groups of people in this country whose personhood has not been recognized. Um, some of you have, might have heard the anti-abortion argument that we have to treat fetuses as persons, uh, and even calling the creation of rights for fertilized eggs, embryos, and fetuses as a personhood movement. I think a real personhood movement is Black Lives Matter. Who are the groups of people who have not yet been recognized as full persons under our legal system? Among those people are the folks who can get pregnant. Um, I started out defending the right to choose abortion, and I started to get the cases where anti-abortion arguments were being used to hurt women who didn't want to end their pregnancies. Some of them were fundamentally opposed to abortion. And I'll just tell one of those stories that really has defined my work and really explains why I started National Advocates for Pregnant Women, because who needs another nonprofit? But okay. Um, uh, I got a call sitting in my office, and it was from a judge in a courtroom or a clerk in a clerk, courtroom in Washington, D.C. A woman, A.C., Angela Carter, uh, had been told when she was 13 she was going to die of a rare form of bone cancer. 
she fought that definition. Uh, she survived, she found her way to NIH, National Institute of Health. She went through multiple chemotherapies and eventually had an entire leg and half her pelvis removed. So she grows, she survives. She defies that you're gonna die, you're gonna die. Uh, and survives into adulthood on one leg. And she graduates from high school, and she gets married, and she's pregnant and wants to be. And one of the first things that happens is like many disabled pregnant women, she can't get the treat, nobody wants to treat her. How do you get her up on the table with one leg? What if she has a recurrence of the cancer? There's enormous discrimination in OBGYN care of disabled people. She finds her way to the George Washington University High Risk Clinic where um, they take her in, and pretty soon thereafter, she says, I'm not feeling right. And they're like, Ugh, you're just a fetchy pregnant woman, and plus you're missing your half your pelvis. Of course you don't feel right. When they finally paid attention to her, they found a tumor the size of a football in her lungs. At which point, unlike most of the cases we deal with, there was no disagreement between Angela and her doctors, or her parents, or her husband. They all said, She's 27 years old, she's only 25 weeks pregnant. Her decision, which we support, is do everything you can to keep her alive. Radiation, chemo, whatever it is. But some neonatologist overheard them say, well, what if she did die? Should we perform an emergency C-section, get that baby out? And instead of talking to Angela or her attending physicians, her doctors, that neonatologist ran to the hospital there and said, I can save all 25 week fetuses. Uh, and the lawyer, instead of saying, you know, we're a hospital, let's go find out what's going on, let's talk to this, she's a person, let's talk to her. He said, what a great idea, and called for an emergency hearing, requesting the judge to decide the question of what rights does the fetus have. They, caught, they had that hearing at the hospital, a lawyer was appointed for the fetus, a lawyer was appointed for Angela who actually knew less reproductive rights law than the lawyer for the fetus. And the lawyer for the fetus basically argued, she's gonna die anyway, you have an obligation to give this fetus a chance for life. Uh, the judge, when, even when the judge found out that the cesarean surgery could kill Angela, the judge ordered it. Um, they took her out of the intensive care unit where she was and was being supported brought her down to the surgical ward where they performed the cesarean. And on her way down, she mouthed the words because she was intubated, I don't want it done, I don't want it done. Her doctors explained that her beloved, trusted doctors did not believe she should have the surgery. They brought her down, they performed the surgery. The fetus was born alive. It was so far from viability, it died within two hours. And Angela Carter died two days later with the cesarean surgery listed as a contributing factor. We brought a case challenging that, what happened to her. And in fact, we ultimately won. But the dissenting judge in that case uh, said a lot of really important things. Uh, he argued that the cesarean surgery was justified because fetuses, viable fetuses, have a right to life. Now they just talk about fertilized eggs, have a right to life. And he did something no other judge has ever done before, since, or since. He said, well, what does this mean for the pregnant person? He actually said pregnant woman. Um, and he said, well, he kind of, he didn't actually delve into it, but he kind of recognized that if fetuses are treated as if they're separate persons with separate rights that other people can enforce for them, a woman might lose a couple of fundamental rights. So let me ask you, what rights did Angela Carter lose? You don't have to go to law school, you all watch Law and Order or something, so just call out a right. <laughs> Civil rights. Civil rights in general, yes. What else? More specifically? Right to life. Right to life. I have taught this in law schools where nobody comes up with the right to life. What else? Right to decide what happens to your body. There is a recognized right to medical decision making and to bodily integrity, which they violated because they cut her open without her consent. Her right to physical liberty, if she had the capacity to escape, there have been cases where they've literally strapped women down to force them to have cesarean surgery. Uh, the right to privacy in all of its broader senses, decision making about whether and when you're gonna be pregnant and have the outcome of your pregnancy. And you know what the judge said? He said, well, 
Preg if, you, if you become pregnant and you continue your pregnancy, you belong to a unique class of persons. Or, and he also said, if you become pregnant and continue your pregnancy to term, you belong to a special class of persons. And those are persons whose fundamental rights can be deprived and denied. We have not yet, there are many groups of people who are not fully protected by our Constitution. And that judge was the only one who was able to articulate that there is a separate group of people who don't get the protection of the Constitution. And those, or the statute or state bills, uh, patient rights and confidentiality in medical care, uh, and those are people who get pregnant. Uh, and that, full, even though we won the case, that argument keeps, those cases keep happening, and one of them has happened here on Staten Island, which is how we all ended up here. But I'll save that for later. Thank you so much. Uh, F.A. and Katie, I'm wondering if you all could speak to how, as birth workers, you have both seen obstetric violence play out when you're with your clients and your patients. Um, it sucks that I've seen it a lot. Um, I would say maybe about 70% of the births that I've seen, I witness obstetric violence, whether it be light of just coercing and fear mongering to I'm going to form a, a forced episiotomy on you. A episiotomy is a surgical cut between a vaginal opening and an anal opening, and so cutting through that area to yeah, it's as gruesome as it sounds, right? Um, and so the most recent one that I saw was earlier this spring. Um, she was a she was a pregnant person from France, and she hired me because she was terrified of birthing in this country. Um, and she had known from different sexes and studies that it was wasn't a safe space for her to be, but she was on Medicaid. She didn't have the option to do a home birth, or and we only have one standing, uh, freestanding birth center in all of New York City, and it was nowhere near her. Um, and so she had predominant labor for three to four days, which means that she had contractions off and on for three to four days. But I was able to calm her, like this is normal. People labor longer than others, and so, but her providers were not happy about this. They want her to come into the hospital immediately. So we would go into the hospital, we would do a non-stress test where they check the baby, check her, and when we pass the test, we would go home. And they wouldn't want you to go home. So when you leave from doing the non-stress test and you get positive, you have to sign an NDA form saying you're now leaving against the doctor's medical orders. And so that's already, you know, exercising her providers, right? So when she does finally go into labor, we get there, um, she does, there is a midwife at the hospital who they don't deliver, but she had to do a prenatal, so she was kind of in the room trying to keep the OB from coming into the room until it was time for her to push. Um, and so when we started pushing, um, they had her bed, they lifted, so basically the hospital bed gets lifted up, they take off the bottom half of the bed and put your feet up in stirrups. Um, you un unclothe and tell you to kind of start pushing. And so if you know anything about biology and the baby's coming out of the pelvis, right? And you need to be able to move your pelvis. There's this bone at the back of your pelvis called your sacrum, right, and your coccyx. If that is very pushed forward, there's no way that the head is gonna kind of go over that. And so with her being supine and her legs being in stirrups, this is her first baby. First time pushing can take an average of two to four hours. Um, and you're kind of just learning what this looks like, right? She did end up having a epidural that she did at once because they were scared that the baby was too big and she may need a C-section. And so with her being supine and having an epidural and her foot being in stirrups and now these things are happening to her that she had um, no plans of happening. Um, and so we pushed for an hour with the midwife and the midwife eventually gets called off the room. The doctors come in. She's pushing a second time. There's maybe at this point 12 people in the room. So there's NICU nurses, the pediatric nurses, there's the physician assistants, there's the provider, the provider's assistants, there's myself and her husband. Um, lights are all on so you can see that this now looks like a chaotic environment. She thinks her baby's gonna die. You know, she no longer can perform in ways that the client. So this is already a circuit violence happening right now, right? Um, 
And so what ends up happening is that I have her focus straight on eyes on me and we're trying to, you know, get her to push. We'll push for another hour. Um, baby hasn't descended much. Part of the cells started to happen with the baby, which is what else is going to happen when mom is stressed out, mom hasn't eaten, you're yelling at her, her foot's up and stairs, a stranger staring at her. Um, the doctors say, if you don't push hard right now, we're going to cut you open. Um, and so all I can do at this point is just to make sure that I'm telling her every procedure that's getting ready to happen so there's less shock trauma value to her body. Um, as he is pulling the scissors, it, all this happens within 10 seconds of him grabbing the surgical scissors to where he cuts her for the episiotomy. And I'm telling her, hey, they're getting ready to cut you. And just in mid sentence, they cut her, I think it was a fourth degree tear. Um, so there's one, two, three, and fourth degree tear. Fourth degree tear is into the uterine muscle. Um, and so it's beyond the skin, beyond the meat, and then into the muscle. So what you see is more purple, um, bluish skin of um, the muscle. Baby comes out screaming, they're saying, oh, the cord is wrapped around the neck. Baby has what we call a nickel cord. Um, very, very, very lightly here. Like literally the baby did this and the cord came around. So the baby wasn't being held by the cord. It was most likely the baby didn't get to descend because of the positions they were in and her not being able to fill her contractions in order to push. Uh, and so baby is rushed over to the warmer. She doesn't get to hold the baby. Dad is crying next to her. Um, she's bleeding from hemorrhaging, um, likely due to the fear, or the fear of what she's, so she's bleeding from hemorrhaging from her uterus and she's also bleeding from the episiotomy. So I'm able to tell where the blood is coming from. Um, baby's over there, they're saying, oh, baby's not breathing. Um, where I'm able to recognize because I'm a student midwife that nobody did an APGAR reading, as well as if a baby comes out breathing and screaming, the APGAR is probably 9, 10. Um, and the baby does not need to go to the warmer, baby can stay with mom. So she doesn't get the baby for the first 45 minutes because they now do the newborn procedures, they do foot um, prints, they do the birth certificates, they're doing all these things before she gets to hold her baby while she's being sewn up. Um, and me having to tell them, you need to apply more anesthesia, anesthesia, like lidocaine because now the epidural is ran off because it's been two and a half hours since they last pushed the epidural button. So she experiences the episiotomy forcefully without that um, and then afterwards. And so this was this woman who really said, I do not want to experience anything and ended up having one of the worst experiences that I've seen. Um, and having to kind of deal with that postpartum rate. And so she, you know, in, in America, you're not seeing any physician for six weeks. And so she's dealing with um, the scar at home. So I'm after giving her medical care advice, even though I'm a doula, and that's against my scope. But who else is going to help her care for her episiotomy score when the doctor is saying, just put an ice pad on it, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Right? And so an episiotomy score can heal, can heal very incorrectly sometimes, it can keloid, it can be problems with sex, it could affect the rest of your life, whether with sex or with birthing the next child. Um, and I've seen forced episiotomies four times in the last four years, uh, in both birth centers and hospitals. And I've also seen sutures done with anesthesia, I've also seen um, C-sections that were coarse, I've seen um, clients give I mean, my clients, I've seen providers give Pitocin, which is an induction drug to speed labor up without their consent or without their knowledge that it's happening. It's me looking over at the IV bag and saying, that's not IV fluids that they're giving you. Do you consent to this? And they're saying, well, you have to have it because of whatever reason that may be. Um, I attended a total of 26 births in the last seven and a half months. While 16 of those were in a hospital. Out of those 16, only one person birthed without any medical intervention. So one person who birthed physiologically normal, you go and have contractions, you go to the hospital, you push, have a baby, bam. Out of all of those births, the rest of them were medically induced for either baby being too big, baby being too small, your fluid levels are too high, your age, um, your over your due date is a big one. Once you hit 40 weeks in two days, they're like, you need to get this baby out of you because it's going to keep growing and you're going to die. But statistics or evidence shows that that's not true. And so there's a lot of things that are happening in evidence-based care. Um, 
but their hospital policy, even though we know that hospital policy is not law, it's treated as law because when you do not follow hospital policy, um, ACS is called on you, our social workers called on you, so now you now have an open case on why you didn't do what your doctor wanted to do. So you have to, have to decide between, do I just wanna have this baby and go home, or do I wanna have a social work or ACS case where I have to go to the courthouse four days after having the baby to tell them, I didn't want a C-section that my doctor ordered me to have, and they think now I'm out of my mind. Um, yeah. I've seen a little. Yeah. Um, everything they said, uh, I've seen happen in, in some capacity. Um, uh, I guess just some vignettes. Uh, at Brookdale Hospital in, in Brownsville, Brooklyn. Uh, when I was training there as a midwife, they had a policy to induce everybody at 39 weeks. And I said to the doctor, do you mean a policy to offer induction to everybody at 39 weeks? He said, no, to induce everybody. And I was like, oh, I'm glad I'm a student here and don't work here because that seems blatantly unethical to me. And he gave me a look and walked away. Um, while I was there, a doctor talked about uh, you know, we talk about dilatation in labor, so the cervix gets progressively bigger. A doctor talked about stretching the cervix to get it to fully so the baby would come out. And I said, aren't you afraid you may rip the cervix if you did that? And he said, oh, well, if I rip it, I'll just sew it. And like, that was the, the, you know, he didn't hold any malice in his heart towards that person. I think in his head, he thought he may be doing her a favor by trying to speed labor up. Um, but still very clearly no baseline respect for her body, her bodily autonomy, the fact that maybe it's not a insignificant deal for her. You know, just because you can sew her up doesn't mean that it's not a big deal for her if you rip a part of her body. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit about some of the obstetric violence I have perpetrated because I think it is really important to understand, you know, doctors and nurses are not going into their profession because they want to treat people poorly. Um, and I think it's really important to understand kind of the mentality and the culture at hospitals that contribute to this. Um, so what I can think of clearly is that when I was working as a labor delivery nurse, I did not ask consent before I did vaginal exams. So I would, I would normally say so, like, I wouldn't be like, vaginal exam now, like it wasn't me about it. I would be like, it's time for your vaginal exam, or your doctor asked you to do a vaginal exam, can you lay down? That's not asking consent. You know, I was informing them that I was about to put my fingers in their vagina, not telling them what's going on and why we want to do this exam and what that information can get us and what the risks are, uh, you know, the risks or benefits by foregoing it. And the reason why I didn't ask consent is a lot of, you know, first is I didn't, it, when I was trained as a nurse, it was not, I was not trained to ask for consent. I was trained to, you know, they said, we need a vaginal exam on room three, go do a vaginal exam on room three. And so, oh, okay, like do a vaginal exam on room three. That was the, that was the mentality that I was trained in. There were times where I would say, I'm going to do a vaginal exam, and the patient was uncomfortable with that. And because I went into this field, because I'm a nice person, I want to treat people nice, they say, oh, okay, well, let me, let me tell your doctor that you have concerns or that you don't want it at this time. And that would instigate a 20 or 30 minute conversation with the doctor where I'm the bad nurse because I didn't get the patient to do the thing they wanted the patient to do so they could manage the labor the way they manage all other labors. Um, so, and even after I had kind of on my own, on my own, uh, for my own reasons, you know, really engaged in reproductive justice work and got involved in activism and started being in the spaces that talked about things like asking consent and obstetric violence. Um, at work, I was in no way supported to be able to approach this as, it, as if it is a conversation that they can opt into or out of. Um, so, you know, if I'm assigned three 
patients and I can only really be in the room for five to 10 minutes because after that, oof, it's been 10 minutes since I checked on that other person. It really, it limits the, the way you think about approaching the patient. It limits, you know, what if they wanna have a 20 minute conversation with you about this procedure and you don't have 20 minutes. Um, so I think it is important to, um, so yeah, so I think it's to understand how pervasive it is uh, also looks at the culture where that we are training healthcare professionals, the support, the resources they have to act appropriately if they, assuming they want to, um, that often that that isn't there. I Thank also you. wanna add that Sorry. I also want to add that when doulas are in the room and something like this is happening, if we stand up and we are loud enough or we're like our client has rights, we get kicked out of the room, right? And so there's a lot of narrative that we need doulas in these hospitals, we need doulas in these hospitals, but these survivors do not want us in these hospitals and they have the final say so. And so when your doula gets kicked out of the room and a nurse comes in and say, well, this is supposed to happen, you no longer have anybody to protect you and help you have you advocate for your rights. And so this is why we have, need to have more conversation on the institutional change of how labor and delivery floors work because we're bringing in band-aids for, you know, someone who chopped off their leg and like, hey, we're just gonna stop this bleeding with this band-aid real quick. But there's, there's a larger problem that is happening and it's how the procedures and policies are done and people's human rights aren't being respected. And add on to the fact that you're a woman, add on to the fact that you're a trans person, add on to the fact that you're pregnant, add on to the fact that you're on Medicaid, public health insurance, whatever that may be, um, it makes it even more, um, you have more things stacked against you and more oppression is affected. briefly touched on this earlier. Uh, you all may have heard of a very widely publicized obstetric violence case that happened right here on Staten Island um, in Northwell Health Staten Island University Hospital when Dr. Spores Bernadre, a woman with decisional capacity to undergo cesarean surgery against her will and without her consent, taking away her right to bodily autonomy and medical decision making, which in fact means that the hospital did not see Bernadre as a full person under the law. So Staten Island University Hospital's doctor did this using an unethical internal hospital policy called managing maternal refusals, which is just as awful as it sounds. Um, and as the recently, report, re recently released report on violence against women from the United Nation in July states, when practiced without a woman's consent, cesarean surgeries may amount to gender-based violence against women and even torture. Uh, so, Lynn, my question for you is, how common are internal hospital policies like this? Well, it's a, it's a limited question, and I have so much else to say. Say it. <laughs> say it all. Um, I, I just want to share with like, my own learning experience. Um, so, when I started to get educated about midwifery and was, well, I learned so much about pregnancy that I didn't know. And so, you know, gravity is this thing that helps things go from up here to down here. So positioning while you're in labor is very important. And I, after I saw the movie The Business of Being Born, which is the best movie on over-medicalization of birth, I think you can access it online. It's the best one because for now it's basically the only one. It doesn't deal with a lot of important issues, but it does have, for example, every doctor they interviewed, they said, have you ever seen a non-medicalized birth? And they all go, no. Um, uh, so, you know, so after I got some education from uh, colleagues and friends, if I was watching a TV show with my children and somebody was laboring in stirrups on their backs, I'd start screaming, not on your back, not on your back. <laughs> So they're very embarrassed to go to movies with me. <laughs> and I just want to say, if, if the hospital policy is to induce at 39 weeks, it's my understanding that the March of Dimes created a campaign called It's Worth the Wait. Because inducing labor at 38 and 39 weeks is called late prematurity. And there's actually important things that are happening when the baby is still on the inside during that period of time. 
Um, but to answer your question, uh, I don't know how many hospitals have written policies that purport to authorize doctors to do immoral, unethical, and illegal things. We know that that happens frequently. Uh, and uh, it makes it that much more insulting and that much worse. But the case that we're talking about is Renat Dre is a, a woman from Brooklyn who is Hasidic. She wants to have lots of babies. She had two, both by cesarean surgery. Uh, and she, if she knew that if she had a third cesarean, it would be very dangerous to ever have any more children. So she worked with her doctor and said, I want to have a trial of labor. I want to try to get this baby out vaginally. I'm not saying it won't do cesarean, but I don't, uh, I would like to try to avoid it. And the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and others say that it is not unreasonable to attempt a, a vaginal birth after one or more cesarean surgeries. She gets to the hospital and lo and behold, her doctor is not there. Another doctor who's been trained in the way other people have looks at her, finds out she's had previous cesareans, and this is my interpretation, freaks out and says you must have cesarean surgery. And when she and her doula say, you're not telling us anything that shows us this baby is at risk or I'm at risk right now, let me continue. My cervix is dilating. Let me give this a try. It turned out the hospital had a written policy that said, if you believe the fetus is at risk, and there's no objective uh, criteria for there, There are criteria for that. But all the doctor has to say is, I, you know, I think the baby, help me out here. What do they say? They say, I think the baby can come out there. Like, <laughs> <laughs> or I, I'll stand here and I'll say, your body can't do this. Mm -hmm. So if the, if the policy says, if a woman refuses um, and you think the fetus is at risk, you can force her to have that surgery. And by the way, you don't even have to go to court to get a court order if you think it'll take too long. Just as long as two doctors and the hospital lawyer are notified, I mean, something like that. We can get you a copy of it. Uh, the state health department, years later, has now said that it violates the patient bill of rights. The problem is it, that determination has not brought about justice for Renat Dre, nor ensured the respect, dignity, and proper health care of other women in New York City or New York State. And what's fascinating is the hospital's lawyers, the doctor's lawyers, the arguments they're making are shocking. And frankly, at this point, the lower courts in New York are agreeing. And the kind of arguments they're making are, well, you know, in the Patient Bill of Rights doesn't say it includes pregnant women, so they're not covered by it, which requires notification and consent. Uh, the Department of Health apparently doesn't agree with that, but we have still not seen a new policy, nor has Northwell, which has 25 or 27 hospitals, responded to us thus far, far to tell us what their policies are in all of the other hospitals. The doctors wrote in the patient's record, patient has decisional capacity, we are overriding it. Now the problem for most women is they don't, they're not honest in their medical records, for, so challenging what happened is very, very hard, and it's hard to document what happened. Also, after you've gone through something like that, the first thing you, know, you don't want to do is call a lawyer or call an organization that's going to ask you to relive this and go through it. So it's very hard to get the documentation that's needed. So you don't have to have that explicit a policy for these to be the policies. I mean, just the, if you have a policy that says you have to induce labor at 39 weeks, to me, that's the same thing. It is something in place that has nothing to do with an examination and evaluation of the woman herself or engagement with her about what she wants. And uh, labor-inducing drugs cause a very painful labor and often speed it up and result in unnecessary cesarean because you're now in so much pain and so much stress because of the labor-inducing drugs that they want to get the baby out. So we are continuing to uh, uh, challenge and support the challenge that Renat Dre has brought. But this happened eight years ago. 
And so bring, fighting for any civil rights, for any human rights, is a long-term battle and a very stressful one for people who are already very stressed out, which is why I'm so happy to see all of you here. And I'm sure Lenat will be very happy too. Absolutely. Um, so we are about to wrap up the panel part of the discussion, uh, but we do want to field questions from the audience because I'm sure you all have some. Uh, so we passed around a piece of paper and the pen. Please feel free to keep the pen. But Sean, can you give a little wave? If, if Sean's going to come around, if you're done with your, or in fact, if you have a question for one of our panelists or just the panel as a whole, if you could just hold it up, well, Sean will come by and, and pick it up from you. Um, yeah, either way, so just hand it up or pass it along or whatever we need to do. Um, but before then, I, or while that's happening, I do have one last question for the panel, and perhaps we can start with Katie. What steps can we as a society make to stop obstetric violence and maternal mortality? Thanks. Uh, so the idea that um, I have been working on and that has been a part of the conversation in reproductive justice circles um, and was, uh, was the theme of this year's Decolonized Birth Conference um, is looking at models of transformational justice to approach obstetric violence. So um, thinking about a process of truth reconciliation and reparations to address what is going on. So I think that is important for, so the two ways that that would look like and why they're both important is um, the most of the scholarship around um, truth reconciliation and reparations in the United States is, I don't think anyone has written specifically on using it to address obstetric violence, um, but really using it to address the fact that we had chattel slavery in our country for 150 years and have never had a meaningful conversation as a country of what does that mean um, and how can we do right by people who were harmed through that institution. Um, so I think that the fact that it is um, set up Sadia Hartman I, I is the scholar who um, talks about the afterlife of slavery. Um, and the, I think the way that we see obstetric violence is a manifestation of the afterlife of slavery, of the fact that we have not put that to bed. Um, and so, um, but we haven't dealt with it in any meaningful way. So I think as a nation, we really need to think of how do we address the racism that has always been with us? How do we address the male supremacy that has always be with, uh, been with us um, so that we don't continue to have century after century of disparate health outcomes? Um, and then also using that to specifically address obstetric violence. So if you were to have a bad birth outcome or if you were to experience obstetric violence at, when you give birth, instead of, right now your options are essentially you can sue or you can become a full-time activist or you can do nothing. There, and there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of room or space for uh, people who may have just uh, may have experienced someone being rude to them or a medical error medical coercion that didn't result in a terrible outcome those our legal system has nothing to say or do for those cases um, and there's really no options of recourse so what what i'm dream, what i'm dreaming of what i'm imagining is uh, um, uh, essentially tribunals that uh, call in the entire obstetric care team and everyone who was involved in somebody's case. Uh, the providers would be paid to come in, so it's not like attacked on to their work. Um, and they would be kind of forced to participate in conversations about what happened and why did it happen and what, like, what was going on in your head when you were doing and saying that. And uh, having a conversation with somebody who, who is um with somebody who understands bodily autonomy and consent and reproductive justice and have a conversation with them to really help them understand their actions in light of what was in light of what went on that that day or in that experience um with uh 
and with an with the understanding that it is almost never so cut and dry as like I woke up one day and decided I wanted to be mean to a pregnant person. Um, so for example, if I got called in to it, like instead of me getting called in either, you know, so nothing happened when I didn't ask consent for vaginal exams because what would have a patient done? You know, that you're not gonna sue a nurse over that. There was no way for them to get in touch with me or my boss to talk about what happened and why. So if we had some kind of uh, process like this, it would give providers space to understand the context of their actions and to change and reform. And it would also provide a measure of accountability where if like, this is your 10th time being called in to a truth and reconciliation, so maybe, maybe this isn't your field anymore. Um, and that it would be run by people with power to, um, to force providers to change or to leave. And it would also give a, an environment to look at um, kind of the root causes. So again, like I wasn't not asking consent because I didn't, because I didn't care about getting consent. I wasn't asking because I didn't understand the, I didn't understand what was going on because I had pressure from my superiors to behave in this way. Um, and I think, uh, so uh, uh, conflict scholar Megan Price talks about using an elicitative approach to conflict resolution. And that is essentially you come to the problem knowing something bad happened, but without pre-assigning who's at fault and who is to blame. Um, I think, sorry, I'm going to, but uh, just before I pass off, like the, the violence isn't mono, it's not one, it is one direction from the providers to the patients, but providers are also experiencing quite a lot of violence. Um, the suicide rate for physicians is higher than almost any other, um, any other profession. Um, uh, lots of female OBGYNs report being sexually harassed by their male coworkers. Um, in training, you, it is normal to not be able to sleep when you're tired, eat when you're hungry, use the bathroom when your bladder is full. And so when we expect healthcare provider, when we don't, when we treat healthcare providers as if they don't have human rights or human needs, it is a huge ask for them to turn around and treat their patients with full human rights. Um, I don't wanna be too much of an apologist for doctors because they have the most social power and they should be able to have regulated that within their profession some. You know, if, if they experienced abuse during training, well, they have 40 years of a career afterwards where they would have an ability to lessen the amount of violence that goes into the training of people behind them. Um, but I think, again, this is where chief reconciliation reparations would would be a helpful framework to break that cycle of violence and to talk about the, the things that contributed to the culture that currently exists. Um, and when, when, they're, when it's out in the open and when all of the contributing factors are addressed, then we can, I think we have more of a hope of, of getting something. Um, I have a little bit, I mean, yes, that was a radical approach, but I have a little bit also a radical approach to how we address maternal mortality. And for me, it's if you can, um, or we create an environment where women or pregnant people have more options to birth outside of the hospital. Um, and it's, it's more of an immediate effect until, you know, the hospital kind of gets their stuff together, right? Um, and this looks like having more midwife access to midwives, having more access to home births, having more access to birthing centers. Currently, right now, we have less than 3% of black midwives for the entire country. So that's 97% of the midwives in this country are white women. And so what we know about culturally conscious care, and we know about the history and all of that, so forth, if we're finding black women are being affected, indigenous women are being affected, and women of, people of color, are being affected by statistics, why would they find that a white midwife would, white midwife would be safe, right? And so the issue that we have less than 3% of black midwives is because we have this history of black midwifery being eradicated um, in the earlier, earlier this century um, where we had obstetric violence 
if second care became normalized uh, when women were going to hospitals, but before that, people were going to the midwives in their community. And so almost all of this country was burned by a black midwife at one point before we entered um, into obstetric care. And the way they got rid of those midwives was by telling um, the community that your midwife is dirty, your midwife is going to kill your baby, your midwife is not safe for your family. And this propaganda was placed around um, the entire through media. You would see newspapers and they would say midwives are dirty, midwives kill babies, come into our hospital. And this kind of, um, Propaganda is still kind of with us today where we think of why would you have a home for your midwife is not safe, your midwife is not trained. And the first thing people think of is well, what if something goes wrong? Because we think midwives are not educated into hoping something goes wrong. But there's also things go wrong in the hospital and you tend to not make it out alive, right? Um, and so I would like for us to have a more conversation about what does that look like to have more member free care. Um, there's tons and tons of studies and articles that show that midwives in your maternal care means you have better outcomes, uh, means you, that you can have a more natural process to your birth, as well as the rest of the world has midwives. And so why are we so behind if we are such an advanced country and we don't have maternal care? Um, the statistic of black women being less than 3% of have, being midwives has a lot to do with the eradication of midwifery, but also our midwifery schools do not have, um, um, the institutions are not really supporting black midwives, if you can think of that. Um, but any undergrad degree is not really supporting black midwives. So that looks like what many students right now who are student midwives, including myself, were having to, um, fundraise, either do GoFundMe or like doing parties and so forth to fund money for us to leave our states, leave our families to go to um, other schools or well in the country because maybe there's like five schools that are safe for us throughout the country, right? And so having to raise money to go to these institutions. So it can take you five to 10 years before you become a licensed midwife to go back to help your um, community that you came from. And it makes it more difficult and so many people who, and this is also for white midwives, but you have more access if you have a trust fund, if you have savings, if you have family, if you have someone who can watch your kids, if you have a husband, if you have a partner who says, oh yeah, go learn to be a midwife in two years and come back and we'll support you while you're doing that. But many black families and Latina families are not able to support that. And so we have harder issues to become midwives. So while we're dying in these hospitals and we're telling people, oh, go get a midwife. Where do we go get a midwife from if our midwives aren't supported to become midwives? As well as the current licensing midwives in New York City, or New York State, um, aren't paid equitably as they our OBs are paid. So an OB gets paid anywhere from eight to 11,000 per birth. A midwife may get half of that. Uh, Medicaid often offers 2,000 or less. If they pay you at all, they often pay three to six months after that person has already, you know, had their child, or the OB may get a direct deposit the next day, right? And so this now becomes it's not a lucrative career, not able to become sustainable, and you will burn burnout. And so you have midwives who are overworked, um, who are not able to perform their best and not able to meet the needs of the community because of all of these institutional barriers to access. Um, and so when we look at, when we're talking about maternal mortality, we're talking about, well, how come they just don't go to persons and home births? We have to also look at institutional life. Who are those going to be survivors? How much do birth centers cost? Why don't we have public funding for birth centers when we have public funding for hospitals? Um, why is there only one birth center for all of New York City? And if you're aware, that birth center has three bedrooms. Right, and it's, um, and it's run by an OB, and, you know, it has very strict, how you can birth here or not you can birth here. And so women are not, pregnant people do not have other options. So we're kind of stuck in this cycle where, okay, I am scared to give birth in America. I'm scared to go to this hospital. Where else can I go? And you start to do your research and then you realize I can't afford a midwife. I can't afford a home birth. I can't find a midwife. My home is not safe. My birth center is too far away. I have to deal with obstetric violence in order to have my child because of the way the system is kind of set up. So yeah, it's fine and bad, I love the support. <laughs> so part, I love these answers. Um, 
part of what um, I've been thinking, thinking a lot about and why I formed uh, National Advocates for Pregnant Women is the recognition that there aren't two kinds of women, women who have abortions and end their pregnancies and women who have babies. They're all the same women, just at different points in their lives. More than half of uh, women who have their first abortion are already mothers. And by the time uh, women are in their 40s, 84% of all women have gotten pregnant and given birth. Uh, so we've created, used the abortion issue to create lots of illusions and delusions about people. Uh, and what, one of the things that I think we need to do is to bring movements on behalf of, for people who are focusing on the birth part to join forces with those who are defending the right to end pregnancy. Because everybody's just advocating for the same women, just at a different moment in their lives. And I want you to think about this. In New York State, or New York City, it's not true of most places in the rest of the country, we have more abortion clinics than birthing centers. And that's not because we're less in favor of birth, it's because of how we prioritize uh, prioritize what we have. Because in the middle of the country, you don't have either. There are no abortion clinics, and you can't access OBGYN care if that's what you want. And there are limitations on accessing midwives as a result of various laws. In fact, I, there's a new, this is the perfect model, Memphis Choices, uh, a clinic that provides abortion services in Memphis, is opening the first full-service reproductive health care center that has abortions and births. And they're going to see the women through all of their reproductive lives instead of putting people over here and there. It's the, the same issues, again, at different moments of people's lives. And another way I want to point out that things connect, in the Renat Dre case and other cases involving forced cesareans, one of the arguments the hospital made and the lower courts in New York so far have made is, well, if it's illegal to have a late-term abortion and kill your baby, then a woman who refuses cesarean surgery late in her pregnancy could also kill her baby, and that has to be illegal too. So they take the anti-abortion arguments and turn them and use them against women who are simply trying to have an unmedicated uh, vaginal birth. Um, there are some things, you, it's true, you're not going to win a lawsuit and it's very hard, but there are places you can complain. Every state has an office of professional medical conduct and you don't need a lawyer to file a complaint. And it may not change anything, but if they get enough complaints, the squeaky wheel does get oiled sometimes. So there are places and uh, we can help direct you to those. Um, I also want to point out uh, one argument for home birth midwives that is sort of the least controversial and most important, a very important one to make. Uh, and it doesn't flip out the dots as much because they often get very defensive. Oh, and they get defensive not only the, the reason abortion became criminalized in the United States, right? Because the white men who were creating the profession of physician wanted to put their competition out of business, black and white midwives, who also did abortions. So they went to their brothers in the state legislature and said, outlaw abortion unless we say it's necessary. So it wasn't a religious movement, it wasn't a moral movement, it was a movement of professionalization of white physicians. At a time when they couldn't save anybody's life because they weren't washing their hands and they didn't know how to do <laughs> surgery, so they could pretend to save life by talking about unborn life. It's the same now. We're knocking off all human life on Earth as a result of climate change, but we can stay focused on saving unborn life and keep us all from saving the lives that are already here. But let me just point out this case, I learned this from the White Women Alliance, um, and my final point. What do you do when there's a disaster? When, the, when Hurricane Katrina uh, hit uh, New Orleans, where did women go who were in labor? They couldn't go to the hospitals, they were shut down. And guess what, the doctors didn't know how to deliver babies without electricity. So the only people who could provide support to the women who needed uh, birthing support were home birth midwives. So I say we need a lot more of them, uh, and we should be supporting them. So thank you. I'm just going to steal the microphone for a second. Um, 
ju just a, pe a picture of uh, what F.A. Lynn so beautifully <coughs> described as more midwives, I think kind of in a sentence or in 60 seconds, what birth would look like or what matriarchal midwifery would look like. I, that's a term coined, I think, by Helena Grant, who's the director of midwifery services at Woodhall. Um, but essentially, a midwife can catch about 20 babies a year without getting burned out. So we don't want, you know, if somebody's awake every night of the week, they're going to be rude to you because they haven't slept. Uh, so a kind of quintessential to having a caring, respectful birth team is having a birth team that your birth is special to them because it is special, because it's not the 15th one they've done that week. Um, and they're not tired from the million other births they've been to. So if midwives catch about 20 babies a, a ba 20 babies a year to a month, you get a vacation for two months, um, then you would start seeing your midwife when you first got your period. And if you didn't like her and didn't trust her, you would have a decade to find a new midwife who you did like and trust. And when you went into labor, because in, in this world, we, uh, capitalism has been dealt with, and so it's not nearly so it's extractive or it doesn't exist anymore. Um, so when you go into labor, you are, uh, anyone, your family or friends who you would want to be there to support you would be able to join you because they would have a month of paid leave to be your support person. Um, and uh, essentially, it's a, a vision where doulas are somewhat obsolete because if you care, trust your care provider and you have your family and friends are available to be with you, then the physical support a doula provides isn't as necessarily anymore. Uh, but we can use them for dying and many other things. Yes, yes, oh, yeah. there's, there's, I mean, in, this, in this world, we would still have some doulas because there, there are always going to be birthing people that don't have family or friends close by and want, you know, or in a situation where they need somebody who is paid. Um, but the first, the first client I had, but I, I guess the way to do this is we open a bunch of midwifery schools and we pass laws that give a crap ton of funding to midwifery schools because we need to essentially like multiply by a thousand in the next twenty to thirty years. Um, but this is, you know, as midwifery schools. Wow. Hmm? Yeah, a thousand midwifery. I, I like in my head, we would make every elder, every respected and trusted midwife into a professor of midwifery and put them into full time training so we could up the profession. Um, but like that, that is that is the type of things we would need to do to exit out of this. Is we would have to have providers we trusted and we trusted them because we've had them for a long time and because they can spend quite a bit of time with us in each interaction because we've taken the financial incentives out of healthcare. Big ideas, <laughs> big solutions. Um, so we have some questions uh, for this last part. Thank you all so much for, for writing these out. And if you have any more, I think we have a couple more pieces of paper, so just snag them. And, but I think this, this might be what we have time for. Um, and so please, anyone just jump in. Um, can someone on our panel please speak to the reason for the disparity in mortality outcome for African-Americans and indigenous as compared to whites giving birth? Um, very brief, short answer. It's called racism. Um, racism in our day lives. So I talked a little bit about weathering earlier, um, but there's also institutional racism where policies are created based on race um, and racism. There's also things that you've heard of, of not being listened to because you're black, you feel more pain because you're black, Mexican women have too many babies, or um, indigenous people, or you know, they don't speak our language, they do not care about our culture. Um, all of those are the racist issues that cause the statistics. So when you hear people say, well, why are you dying? Is it genetically something happening? Are you, do you not have enough money? When you think of, I don't know if y'all heard of the case of Serena Williams almost dying during childbirth. That is someone who almost everyone in this world knows, right? And who has lots of access and lots of power and still had to fight her way to make sure that she stayed alive, right? And so when we know that money wasn't an issue for Serena Williams, celebrity wasn't an issue for Serena Williams, her having the best healthcare providers was a Serena Williams, but it was someone who said, oh, you're fine. 
And there's that constant, like what Katie mentioned, and her also performing assertive violence disorders because how that's how they're trained. And so when you are trained to ignore black and indigenous and brown people, you're not going to see your implicit bias that is happening, or you're not going to see that subconsciousness is when it's happening unless you're being called out on it. Um, so yeah, that's kind of why we have the maternal mortality outcomes that we do now. And let me just add, when, when people were trying to explain black maternal mortality, they really tried so hard to blame it on things like they must be using drugs. And that's absolutely untrue. One of the things, we do a lot of cases where women are arrested uh, in relationship to pregnancy and drug use, even though none of the criminalized drugs are pregnancy-ending drugs. Uh, and what I've learned from talking to experts is it turns out, and why weathering and racism are the explanation, is really there's pretty much almost nothing a pregnant woman can do once she gets pregnant that has more impact on the outcome of her pregnancy than her life course leading up to becoming pregnant. Uh, and I'll add that in New York City, in New York City, our, the disparity is much worse than the nation at large, and that is uh, most major cities have worse disparities, and that is because of a specific manifestation of racism, which is the structural racism of how we pay for healthcare. So in Brooklyn, um, the, we have 10 hospitals with maternity services, and the three hospitals that serve predominantly African Americans or black, predominantly black people, Kings County, SUNY Downstate, and Brookdale Hospital, which have a 70 to 90% of their, of their patients are black. Um, those three hospitals also receive significantly less money from the state. And SUNY Downstate, which is the most dangerous hospital in Brooklyn, there are three hospitals within the SUNY system. The two other hospitals that are predominantly white serving get a million dollars a year from Governor Cuomo. And, and looks like it. And SUNY Downstate does not. And there's no reason, there's not like projects going on at those hospitals that aren't happening at SUNY Downstate. Governor Cuomo is exercising white supremacy because there is less complaints and less political power from East Flatbush to demand that $50 million. And because there, he, there's no political backlash from him depriving our community of the money that we would need to run a functioning hospital, um, he gets away with it, so he does. Um, so when we, the, about somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of the disparity we see in New York City would go away if black women delivered at the same hospitals that white women were delivering. And it, it comes down to poor conditions in a handful of minority, minority serving hospitals that, um, ex, that exponentially increase the disparities. In a smaller city nationwide, black women and white women go to the same hospitals. And so even if you experience interpersonal racism with the providers there, um, so let's say a white nurse takes your blood and she's rude to you, but when she sends that blood to the lab, you still get the results in 30 minutes. So whereas if you go to a predominantly black serving hospital, the nurse is still probably gonna be rude to you because she's much more likely to be understaffed and have had a really hard shift. But then when you send the blood to the lab, it takes four hours to get the results back because the people who are supposed to be working there got laid off because we don't have enough money. Um, and so I think it's important to realize when we say racism, we don't just mean a white person being mean to a black person. That it is the a hierarchy of human value that it expresses itself in structures, even when that was not necessarily, or may not have necessarily been the design intent, but when the outcome is the, uh, the systemic de defunding of black serving hospitals, it has, um, it is, that's still racism. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we also, we have one more, but another question that we have um, is what can pregnant people do to prevent violence during labor or what can they do if they were victims of obstetric violence? And I'm going to tie this one in, tie this one in with um, if you feel that your rights have been violated during childbirth, how much time does someone have to seek legal help if they see that there are grounds for legal action? So kind of 
what can you do to prevent it? And if it's happened, what's the next step? And how much time does one have? How much time do you have for seeking uh, So um, I'm not a medical malpractice lawyer, but for example, Staten Island University Hospital is a private institution. If it had been a city or a state hospital, I could have brought my expertise under the Constitution, but because it's a private hospital, it's a private medical malpractice case. And if you are injured, if they, if they um, cut you open without your consent, that's a battery, and you only have one year to file your complaint on that particular claim. And if you, if you were not severely injured and your baby wasn't severely injured, you're gonna have one hell of a time trying to find a malpractice lawyer who will take your case. Because, it's, because our system does not value pregnant women and what they suffer, they're like, well, there's just not gonna be any money in this and it's too hard to bring a case, it takes years. So, uh, and, and that's what happened uh, to Renat Dre. She could not find a lawyer until the first year had passed and there were many other violations of her rights, and those cases have gone forward, but you want to do it very quickly. And what to do when you're in labor, that's a challenge, because you're incredibly vulnerable in that position. You, we, the, having a doula, having family there, I think it may be most important to try to suss out what your hospital, what your doctors are, are typically doing, and try to uh, be prepared for that. So it's really tough. I'm not sure about the legal side, but I will say that you do have right to say no to anybody and any everybody who comes in your birth room. So if you don't want that OB, you don't want that nurse, you don't want the anesthesiologist, you can say, I no longer want service from you. And you need, they need to chart that you no longer want services from them. So you have the right to fire your providers. You have the right to walk out of hospital when you're eight, seven meters and getting ready to push to go to another one or to you know figure out what that may look like for you. It is very difficult for me to get clients to do that um, because you know, we're, you're thinking of your baby, right? But if you are aware that you have the right to say no at any point, um, regardless of the consequences that they're gonna meet you with, the complications that they're gonna meet you with afterwards, um, it's always better to kind of say no in the beginning than to have the procedures done and then to try to fight for it afterwards. Um, Evan, can you take us out and with that one last question? Sure. Yeah. Um, so it says, what can we do now? Um, response, focus on advocacy and policy that we can do on our on one-on-one to basics, one-on-one basics. My SLL is due in January. How can I help support her without scaring her? Um, so the first question, what you can do now, um, we now know that government support is probably not the fastest way of changing things. There is um, Black Mamas Matter is a national org that has um, organizations throughout the entire country that are supporting um, birth justice and reproductive justice movement. Um, there's a Twitter, there's an Instagram, there's a conference yearly, um, and everybody that you think is mentioned today is probably part of the Black Mamas Matter, and you can find someone local to you. Um, there's also um, working with the birth justice defenders as well. Um, in order for the last and second question, I would support, help support her without scaring her, get her a doula, uh, get her a doula, attend all visits with her, and at any point that you feel your provider or your hospital space is not safe, please leave. Do not, you know, excuse your way into it and make assumptions of why you should stay. Please leave. We have a midwife right here. Uh, <laughs> Um, contacting midwives who are local, but in terms of not scaring her, I would provide her with facts. It's better to scare her now with facts than to scare her in the middle of a contraction um, with whatever you may be giving her to. So I definitely say pre-education. Childbirth education should be mandatory and not the childbirth education that the hospital provides because that is a biased education training. 
uh, taking an out of the hospital childbirth education class is practical, doing the lactation visit, and as well as preparing for postpartum care up to the first 40 days, I say six to eight weeks of having someone who is going to be around almost 24 seven postpartum. Um, we don't think a lot about what that looks like when helping that person. So I hope that answers your question. Let's give a big round of applause for that.